The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus. Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of Man may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of the world. But those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling for you. When she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? 
Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believe you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I retired once, um, and, and nine years ago. Um, I spent the first year after I retired attending St. Joseph's Roman Catholic Parish, the Jesuit Parish downtown, for a year. It was wonderful. Uh, the priest was an excellent preacher and the communal life was amazing for a congregation as large as that one. But then um, there was this fateful day when I got a phone call um, saying that the bishop wanted me to come here soon. And so I came and, and did what I had promised to do was I don't want to do the pastoral work. I know there's a deacon to do that. Uh, I don't want to do the administrative work. I vowed that when I retired, I would never fill out a parochial report ever again. Um, and so, but we had a wonderful time. Uh, and it has continued to be a wonderful time. Um, I wrote a letter to y'all uh, that has been in the companion and in the bulletins, and um, I, I want to talk a little bit about that, and then we'll get on to the sermon. First of all, I want to thank Father Michael for inviting me to preside and preach at this morning's Eucharist. I honestly don't know when I might do that again, um, and there's a reason for that, you know. The, the responsibility that you have within the body of Christ has something directly to do with the sacramental things that you do. And so since I'm probably not going to be doing those things, um, I, I'm going to take a different track. Um, I'm leaving the active parish ministry to be fully retired. Fully retired. I thought, I'll never do that. I, yes, I am. I'm going to be fully retired. And for the first time in 50 years, I will step outside the organizational and institutional life of the Episcopal Church. Praise God. <laughs> you know, one of my friends who um, uh, got elected to bishop of the Diocese of Iowa, I had a phone conversation with him about a year and a half after he'd been elected. And he said, my God, John, it's the whole state. <laughs> we had to go around and visit all these parishes, and he said, I spend half of my time disciplining clergy. I said, not what you thought it was going to be, right? And he said, no. 
Um, so anyway, there's uh, St. John Chrysostom said that the road to hell is paved with the bones of priests and bishops. So <laughs> there's a kind of attitude about the institutional life of the Episcopal Church or any church. What I am going to do is I'm going to step deeply into my spiritual and the metaphysical aspect of my life to step into it without being tightly involved, responsible for, and preoccupied with the ongoing life of a faith community. My Trappist spiritual father, Robert, told me 10 years ago that his hope and prayer for me, that's when I retired for the first time, was that I would someday be able to do what I'm about to do. He called it rolling away the stone over my interior connection with the Holy Spirit, allowing the stream of living water from Christ's heart to flow freely. It's a lot more work than you think, uh, and it's too easy to get distracted from it. I'm going to really try to be loyal to Robert and to that uh, Trappist community in Ava, Missouri, um, that I spent so much time with for over 30 years. Um, and, uh, what Robert also said is, John, there's part of you that wants to be a monk. <laughs> and it's true. Um, so we're, gonna, we're going to, uh, I'm going to try to do that. Um, so that's what's going to happen with me. Um, people keep asking me, oh, are you going to come back to St. John's? And at this point, no. Um, I mean, not because I don't love you and I, and I don't want to be around you. It's that what always happens to me is somebody suggests someplace, someplace for me to go to do something <laughs> that is part of the organizational and institutional life of the Episcopal Church. So I'm going to try at 78 um, to, to, to do this thing. Now for the sermon. Today's collect of the day prays that, and this is a beautiful language, among the, Thomas Cramner wrote this collect, by the way. Among the swift and varied changes of the world, which go even faster for us than they did in his time, our hearts may surely there be fixed where true joys are to be found. That is, among the swift and varied changes of the world, our hearts may be surely there be fixed where true joys are found. True joys. We'll talk about that in a minute. This morning's reader reading from Paul's letter to the Roman begins with a powerful wisdom statement. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. To set the mind of the flesh is death, but to set the mind of the spirit is life and peace. My, new, my seminary New Testament professor told us that the best way in our time to think about the word that's flesh in English in the Bible Sarks in Greek refers to all that is limited, temporary, and passing away. It isn't just this. All that is limited, temporary, and passing away. On the other hand, the spirit and the things of the spirit are infinite, eternal, and create new life. That long passage about the dry bones, you know, it's hard not to hear that music, that bones, that bones. But, but it talks about the breath. The breath is the spirit. And what that passage deeply is about is that the spirit can give new life. It can replace the old life with a new life. So that the things of the spirit are infinite, eternal, and create new life, and the things of the flesh are limited, temporary, and passing away. Much of what holds our attention in daily life, 
all across the country is power, wealth, control, success, and happiness. <coughs> power, wealth, control, success, and happiness. And those things are in fact limited, temporary, and passing away. Now what I would like to say, but then we'd have to get in a big discussion at coffee hour and I don't want to do it, is those things are not real. They are not real. Yes, they absorb attention and everything else, but they don't last long enough. They're not permanent enough to be the kind of reality upon which one can base their lives. There are things that are illusory. One of the things the dark side always does to us is to try to convince us that these kind of things are what's real and the spiritual things are not. They're illusory. And one could even say that sometimes in this culture they're delusional. remember a parishioner uh, that had moved into a really, one of the, you know, the Street of Dreams houses, had moved into a Street of Dreams house over by Woodenville. And I went to visit the house and do a house blessing, and they both said to me, this house is full <coughs> of stuff that we really, really wanted. But we're lonely. We're lonely. Mm -hmm. Try to pump up a house blessing after that, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is an exorcism. This part, this prayer is an exorcism. We'll see if we can get do something. The Holy Spirit can do something now. And the things of the Spirit are eternal, life-giving, and always powerful. Focusing on the things of the Spirit give eternal life, peace, and ultimate life meaning. The things of the Spirit are where our hearts, minds, and souls truly need to be fixed. The good news is that in our baptism we have been anointed with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and given the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You know, we're not going through the motions. We, our prayer book be happy to tell you we've been talking about this, that something really happens to you in baptism. Something that's not visible and comes from the greater reality of life. I have to tell you that I've been a priest for 50 years, as you well know. And I've discovered in that 50 years that faith communities are often preoccupied with gaining power, control, money, success, and getting our own way. That's putting the church right in the middle of stuff that doesn't last long enough to be redemptive. In this preoccupation with illusory passing away things, the real things of the Spirit are often forgotten. I believe that God will give us true life and meaning. Those divine gifts will come to us if we focus our hearts, minds, and souls on the things of the Spirit. Baptism, the Holy Eucharist, profound prayer, authentic worship, and loving others as Christ loved us. In doing those things, we will be fixing our hearts, minds, and souls on what is ultimately fundamental to Christian life and faith. These things are what things that so many in this world hunger to find. They're what gives true meaning, real belonging and healing in the new death-defying life. <coughs> My hope and prayer is that St. John's will be a community find focused primarily on the things of the Holy Spirit 
and the gifts that the Spirit gives. I believe that's the core of what Martin Smith taught us. You remember Martin Smith? So, my beloved friends, as I take my leave from you, may our hearts, minds, and souls be fixed where true joys are to be found and the stream of living water from Christ's heart to flow freely. That is where real growth and new life will come. And I'm glad to really bet my life on it. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.